Yeah. Okay, because then you'll get the thumbnails on the left, which will let you advance them without scrolling. Okay, what I do here is page One down scrolling. like this. It's page down working? Oh, well, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. Because so, right. so it wasn't working for you before. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, th I don't want to touch something, but I, I think it's in the, um, the scrolling. You have vertical, uh, horizontal, and wrapped. And I think that's a wrapped uh, option that worked. Okay. So um, let's start. Um, so, Med, do you want the, the chair slides or you want to, want to go through those? Yeah, yeah please, please go ahead. That's, okay. that's fine. So, I'm starting the recording. Um, let's start this. Uh, interim meeting, page 10 is working. Um, so make sure your video is off. I think it's fine. Mute your microphones um, unless you're speaking. Yeah, we're going to use the, the WebEx chat for the queue and uh, fill the blue sheet that are in the Etherpad. So the Etherpad, I think everyone got the, um, the link or maybe Med, you can add the the link into the, yeah, the Jabber right. room or share it anymore. Okay. So yeah. So make make sure the the blue sheets are filled. Um, this is the not, not well. You're not sharing anymore. I'm not sharing anymore. No. Okay. Can I say you're not sharing anymore? Any okay. We see nothing. Yeah. You were sharing and then you did something yeah. and stopped. So I'm, I'm going to try to reselect this. <laughs> and I was sharing the note well. <laughs> it's an important slide. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost the, the only reason we have this uh, chair slides and not the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see those uh, being shared. Oh, yeah. Is it fine? Yep, it's good now. I have it. Okay. So if you're not aware of the not well, please um, read this slide um, or take the time to read it. Um, and be aware that does not well applies to this interim meeting. So logistic, we need a mini ticker. So who is volunteering? We'll take minutes. Okay, thank you, Michael. So Jabba room, um, everything is, uh, well, you have all the links there. The document the status, uh, for the documents, um, we are essentially wor working on two documents, which is the architecture. I mean, the, I think the right order should be requirements and the architecture. So that's the two ones we would like to move forward um, before going any further. Um, we're socializing DRIP um, outside of the ITF. So um, maybe, Bob, you want to say a few words on that? I gotta mute myself. Okay, uh, always helps to unmute. Um, the uh, ANSI UAS roadmap um, version two is in final edits. Uh, they have to finish it this week. Uh, we have like one more call tomorrow. Uh, I've gotten general text in the SDO section of chapter four on the general IETF definition. Um, um, blurb our charter and then pointer to our, our document page and I've gotten into specific gaps where we have uh, items or items addressing that I've gotten uh, work in progress IETF and reference to those documents so um, IETF will be in the final release of the ANSI UAS roadmap um, which FAA is um, 
um, representatives in the discussion are quite pleased with. So uh, we, we squeaked in and uh, we made it in. We'll have time when, with version 3 to be more effective, but they want to get version 2 published uh, by the end of June. So the final edits are supposed to be in um, Friday. So that's, that's the status of the ANSI UAS roadmap. Um, and um, more, Stu can talk to the IKO digital identity. Uh, it's uh, coming up. Uh, actually, their, their first meeting is right now. They had to uh, cancel over this for their major stakeholders are only available at this time. Stu and I will be joining their um, meeting next week. And this is a normalization of digital identity across aircraft, both manned and unmanned. So uh, we have quite a bit to say in that. They are interested. Stu is the one who got our foot in the door on that. And uh, we're uh, um, probably should let him speak to uh, how that's progressing. But we expect to be able to uh, have uh, considerable um, input into this um, um, IKO digital identity um, efforts. Stu? Yeah, uh, for anyone who's not familiar, um, IKO is the International Civil um, Aviation Organization, and their members are nation states, uh, of which there is 193 currently. Um, they have an effort called the International Aviation Trust Framework which has three um, subordinate uh, working groups, one of which is on digital identity, one of which is on trust reciprocity, and one is the uh, Global Resilient Aviation Interoperable Network, which is their own uh, walled garden internet on which they have been working with uh, ICANN to get a big honking IPv6 uh, address block and I've been sticking my oar in, as you might imagine. And uh, fortunately, um, we have other uh, IETF representation there as well. Uh, Fred Templin, although he has obviously a very different approach, technically. Um, and we have a great champion in uh, Rob Seegers of the FAA. He is their chief architect of what they call next gen, which is exactly that, the next generation of you know, how we do aviation. Okay, interesting. Um, thank you. Um, I, I see on the queue that um, we got Mr. De Silva. Uh, thanks. Uh, good morning, all. As just to uh, a, a small observation, the name of the IKO group, although it's too correctly explained, the, uh, the the groups existing. But in case of IKO, the focus will be always what we call. TFSG or Trust Framework Study Group instead of directly the identity, although the working group on identity is the one dealing with um, digital identity for many and a many aircraft. Thank you. Thank you. Um, third ballot, do you want Stu to go on um, with the registration to the operation workshop? Okay, so uh, I got an email back um, just after midnight from the organizing committee um, saying that uh, ROW number nine has uh, accepted our uh, abstract and we need to confirm our final title by tomorrow. And they would like to give us a total of a 20 minute time slot, including both the presentation and the Q&A. Um, this is the registration operations workshop, and uh, they're also going to have a panel discussion focused on DNS privacy and encryption. And they've invited uh, one of us to participate in that panel. So one thing I'd be looking for today is, do you all want me to handle that, or is there someone who would like to step up to be um, our working group's um, speaker, if you will, on the panel focused on DNS privacy and encryption. Okay. So uh, I, I'm wondering where does this workshop takes place? 
Um, give me just a moment. It was supposed to be face to face, and I think it was supposed to be in Montreal. Okay. Uh, but it's actually going to be virtual. Um, give me just a moment to dig it up. I think it's uh, June sixteenth. Yeah, we can do that um, another time to think uh, a little bit more on that. So, yeah, if anybody wants to go to the um, website, it's uh, regiops.net, R-E-G-I-O-P-S.net. And it is indeed online on June 16th from 1300 to 1600 Universal Time. OK, thank you. Yeah, just one comment about the, I would say, the, um, the uh, DNS privacy, etc. I don't think that we, as a working group, we have, I would say, the, uh, um, the, um, the authority to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to talk or about, uh, I'd say, um, uh, about the current views from the ATF, about the extensions to DNS privacy and so on. And I, I do think that the, uh, the more appropriate working group are more people from DNS up or um, add working groups. So I think that Eric, um, uh, we, we, can, we can always attend as individuals, but I don't think as a working group, we can present, I would say, um, a view on this on these extensions. If Eric can handle, I would say, this request to, uh, to, to people from DNS up or um, add, add related, related working group, that would be really great. Actually, there is another working group that's doing this, which is deep pride in its privacy. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but so, I, I Eric, think. Eric, please go, Matt. Yeah. So, Eric, do, do, do you um, can, can you please take care of this request and relay this? I would say the um, the um, this invitation to uh, to um, deprive chairs if they want to uh, to to attend this this panel. Yeah. The only thing is to is you can send me the information. Yes, I, I will forward it, forward it to you um, uh, immediately. Okay. Thank you. Sure, and and I don't think they were asking us to represent the IETF on DNS privacy and encryption. I suspect DNS Priv is probably already participating. I think what they were looking for is would we be willing to participate in the panel from the perspective of you know the application that we are addressing. Yeah, that was my understanding as well. Okay, so. Well, we need to think a little bit on that um, to, to clarify that. But I, I think it's really important that, um, uh, um, I mean, the, this socialization work you're doing, um, and especially this workshop is a very good um, introduction to um, the architecture document where we could see, um, I mean, how we can take um, the, uh, leverage from DNS, but also what are our specific requirements um, um, and and regarding to the DNS protocol, that's one aspect, but the other one is um, is also the DNS architecture. So next slide, um, the agenda today. Well, we have only, I mean, we have two main documents, which is the requirements and the architecture document. So um, emphasizes is going to be on the requirements. And then open mic will follow. So the agenda, and here is a here is a slide. So the floor is yours. Okay. Um, I'd like to rip through these a lot more quickly than uh, the time that you've given me. So next slide. Okay. So I, I'm jumping right in because you've all seen the background, and if you haven't seen the background, uh, some of it's in the backup slides. So the first three and most fundamental general requirements are provable ownership, provable and binding, and provable registration. Um, by provable ownership, uh, this means that the ID that is asserted, um, the prover needs to prove that in fact uh, they are in possession of the private key associated with that ID. Um, Provable binding just means, well, there's there's more than just the identity claim message, the so-called basic ID message in the ASTM standard. There's messages about, you know, where am I and in what direction am I going and how fast, and we want to bind all those other messages um, to the ID. Um, and then finally, uh, provable registration. 
I want to say not only I am Stu, but I am Stu and I am in the, you know, blue registry as opposed to the red or the green registry or whatever. And um, the value of that um, uh, is, you know, first off, to just prove that I really am in a legitimate registry, any legitimate registry. But then if the registries are colored, if you will, now um, that coloriz colorization of the registries can be used uh, by observers to make trust decisions um, just based upon, you know, what club's membership list am I on? Uh, any discussion of these requirements before we move on? Okay, next slide. Um, these are less fundamental, but uh, nonetheless important. Um, the uh, registries as contemplated by the folks who were working this problem before we came along, um, we're just looking at, oh, great, there's this free text in a registry and, and eyeballs can look at it and they, they can do stuff with that information. Um, whereas we think it's important that software be able to do stuff with that information as well. Um, gateway, uh, this is an idea that Bob has been working, the idea of crowdsourced remote ID. Uh, I don't explicitly reference crowdsourced remote, remote ID as such in the requirements. Um, because that's a you know a solution approach um but i do say that we need to be able to get back and forth between broadcast a remote id and network remote id actually not back and forth just forth because you, you would pipe broadcast into network wouldn't make any sense to pipe network into broadcast um and then i'm calling it finger because that's what it feels like to me but we need a better name we need a way to reach out and touch someone uh in other words because um this identifier we're going to make software readable, not just human readable. We want to be able to take that identifier and use it to reach out and establish um, IP based connectivity, which is not the same thing as saying that we want the identifier to be an IP address. That would be a tragic mistake. Uh, any discussion on these three? Okay. Um, and please, somebody who has a better name than finger, send it to me in an email or whatever. And next slide. Great. Okay, these are uh, a family of miscellaneous requirements. Um, even though QoS might seem to be a reach here, um, really uh, the, these messages are being required by the external standards and the regulators to go out with a certain frequency, to be received with a certain frequency. Uh, in other words, you know, maybe I send them um, once per second um, and we need to ensure that over a period of three seconds, at least one of those three gets through. Um, Obviously, mobility is central to what we're doing here. That drives a requirement for multi-homing so that you have make before break handoff um, and, and just general resiliency. Um, multicast, I've listed it as a should. Um, I've received some commentary that perhaps it should be a must. Um, I, was, I was leery of making it a must, even though I'm a huge IPv6 multicast fan and, and see it as having a lot of applicability. Um, and then finally, management. Um, you know, the, the people who are using this for um, situational awareness of what's going on in the airspace, um, they need to know uh, how good their receiver network is. You know, are there holes uh, in the coverage where they would have uh, visibility? Any discussion on these? So I think on the queue, I have um, Eric. Yeah, a quick question. So you presented last time a very similar requirements. Are they identical or have there been some changes? Oh, I'm sorry. We appear to be looking at the previous version of the slides. Um, the, I had an, an introductory slide that I didn't see just now that's a, um, a summary of changes. So do you want me to go uh, at a specific slide or? Um, well, I, I, um, think, I, I think I'll go yeah. back to the beginning and we'll see if it's there. But I think you may be working with the previous version. Yes, I, I, I think so. OK. I have already sent you the link, um, Daniel, so you can just use it. And don't derail everything, right? So continue to. Okay. All right. Yeah, so drop down to the next page of requirements after number 11. Uh, I can change the, the, sli the slides if you want. Sure, that'd be great. Okay. Let's see. I'm improving. <laughs> so tell me. Uh, uh, up. Uh, back up one. Uh, right there. That's the one that Eric just asked for. Thank you. 
their definitions. We got rid of a lot of the redundancy between the two documents, which um, had not been intentionally inserted as a copy and paste. It was, it was a result of the two documents being forks of what was originally a single document. Um, there were some things that were essentially unnumbered requirements that were late ads previously that are now numbered requirements. Uh, we've broken out the registry requirements as a separate group rather than having them lumped into the general. We've done a lot of the harmonization as discussed. I've updated some of the references to other drafts. Bob has been extremely busy. He's quite a prolific writer. Um, uh, Andre Gertov gave us a discussion uh, limitations section. Um, Bob gave me a uh, section on the privacy. Oops, I've got a redundancy right in there. Broadcast personally identifiable information privacy section. Shouldn't be a second PII um, in the architecture draft. Um, uh, Andre Gertov has also given me some ASCII art, which has gone into both drafts. We've got additional authors now, um, Andre and Xu Zhao. Um, and we've got comments in there from all of those people and probably a couple of others. I tried to be comprehensive in listing them, but I've doubtless made an omission at some point. So now let's jump down to requirement number 11. And on to the next, uh, identifier requirements. Um, the first five requirements are uh, as before, um, but per some advice received, I added the parenthetical note on ID number one length. We didn't make up this 20 bytes. This is to fit into the uh, ASTM F3411 standard, which is recognized by the civil aviation authorities. And they, in turn, are attempting to fit into a Bluetooth 4 uh, advertisement payload, which only has a total of 25 bytes, and there's about five bytes of overhead of the F3411 uh, wrappers, leaving us only 20 bytes for the actual ID itself. That's the only change here in the identifier requirements. Next slide. All right, now there's an additional... Oh, um, back up one, please. Yeah, there's an additional identifier requirement beyond the five we previously had, this is unlinkability. Um, that had previously been addressed in the text, but not as a numbered requirement. Um, and then we've got some what I'm calling explanatory text that um, were, um, th this is not a requirement on identifiers. Um, and we don't know who's going to actually assign identifiers, um, but <coughs> all of these entities need to be in agreement on what an identifier is. Next. Okay, privacy requirements. Um, these are pretty much uh, as before, and I have gotten some feedback that um, storage requirements is going a little bit beyond um, the field that the IETF normally roams. Now, um, there's a, a lot of debate on the privacy stuff because it's a it's a um, a balance between privacy of the operator and transparency of what's going on in the airspace around me as a member of the public who presumably has a legitimate right to know you know what all this buzzing is that's going on over my head that potentially might fall on my head. Um, so um, I guess all I can do right now is note that there is tension between those two uh, competing concerns. <clears throat> which is why in the initial um, regulations and the ASTM standard, everything is uh, clear text. Next slide. I, I would point out uh, on this slide um, that I've tried to capture that tension in the discussion I have in the uh, drip operator privacy draft and kind of show you know, when you can and cannot expect to be private. So uh, comments on that text would be greatly appreciated from all parties. Thanks, Bob. All right, uh, next slide, if we could. Yeah, uh, just a comment. I think one of the problem is that privacy is is not a generic context, a, gener a generic concept. You you want to be private to some members and um, disclose your privacy, being able to disclose that privacy to others. So that's where um, I think some of the balance should be. 
Yes, definitely. There's, there's, a, there's a, a, a scoping of privacy. Privacy from whom and, um, you know, under what circumstances. My privacy uh, expectations uh, can be higher when I'm hovering over the middle of my 300-acre farm than when I'm hovering by the fence to the neighboring nuclear reactor. Yeah. Next slide, please. Okay, these uh, mostly were here before. Uh, as a matter of fact, they were all here before, but they were just lumped in with general requirements, and the general requirements list was getting pretty long, and this was actually a logical grouping. Unfortunately, I just made more work for Bob because he now needs to go through his drafts and, and uh, change some of the references therein. Um, but these are the, uh, the registries requirements of which we are thus far aware. Just a comment about this one, uh, Stuart. I, in, in the review I have sent to you, yeah, so there, there is some, I would say, some mentions of the individual drafting requirements. So I don't know if you have cleaned up that, that part or so that we can focus only on the requirement itself rather than going into, I would say, specific solution uh, documents. Right. Yeah. Um, so Bob has just written uh, recently a UAS RID draft, um, which is you know, my look at it is it's it's essentially what used to be called within the IETF an applicability statement, pointing out other uh, drafts that address um, specific issues of the problem, and uh, Bob's regarding that as kind of the uh, the clearinghouse for where all the gazindas and gazaudas of different documents um, could go, and uh, so I can you know point to that, and I, I began to point to that in the most recent rev of uh, requirements and architecture. Yeah, my point is that if we, um, if to, is to avoid, I would say, pointing to um, to to other documents and to generalize or to um, to uh, to sketch or to um, to write the requirement in such a way that we are not, um, I would say, promoting some some solution document. So that's we can have something which is really uh, standalone. We don't we don't need to uh, to point to other individual documents. Uh, that would be more cleaner for me for a requirement document. I, I, I know that you have already done some work to, uh, to remove some, some of that in the, in the previous version, but I see that we, can, we need to do um, um, a little bit more effort to, so that we, uh, we can, I would say, remove these pointers, because I, I think that we don't need the, those pointers. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's probably some vestigial stuff that needs to be scrubbed out. Okay, that was it for uh, what I had for um, requirements. Um, basically, it was it was a lot of cleanup of the organization of the requirements. Um, I didn't really have any new requirements um, brought to me in the past month. So, shall we proceed with architecture? Then, do we have any Next. questions? Uh, I see no one in a queue, so let's move ahead. This slide is as before, just as context. These are the, the players, the aircraft themselves, the observers, the operators, public and private registries, and DNS. Um, and one of the things that I definitely need to do in the requirements draft is clarify what's an operator versus a pilot in command versus a remote pilot, and, and, and so on. Um, that is reflected here in this slide and it's reflected but not explicitly in the requirements draft and i want to go back to people like um Ikeo and make sure that i use their definitions rather than rolling my own i mean this is a this is a well established community that's been setting standards for decades and they have a language and we want to speak their language Okay, this is one of the pieces of ASCII art that uh, Andre provided. Um, it just shows that the uh, network grid data flow may or may not start with the unmanned aircraft, although there is definitely information flow back and forth between the unmanned aircraft and its uh, operator. Um, but then basically network grid starts with the operator's uh, uh, ground control station, flows through the internet to the network grid. Oops. Uh, Got to make a correction here flows from the operator to the service provider, from the service provider to the display provider, from the display provider to the observer. So I just got to change DP and SP. I got to flip, flip those labels. Um, next slide. Uh, this is unchanged. This is the list of entities. Um, 
and most of the entities um, pre-exist. They are not things that DRIP is defining. Um, even the registries, um, we're just adding detail that is missing from the external standards. Everybody knows there need to be registries, but everybody has punted um, what those registries will look like and you know what protocols will be used to put information into them and pull information out of them. Um, and then, of course, um, if someone adopts the optional crowdsourced remote ID, uh, then that adds uh, two additional entities, um, some hopefully large number of finders and at least one supplemental data service provider to aggregate the information from all of those finders and make it available. Next slide. Stuart Silhol, um, quick question. Anyone willing to say something? Silhol, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Thanks a lot. Um, sometimes I have some audio problems here, but uh, back to Stuart. Um, Stu, on the registries, are we assuming, um, who are we assuming is owning or responsible for those registries? For instance, so the US, the FAA uh, would have a registry of registered aircraft and potentially licensed pilots. And makes that available through what they call the FIMS to the, UT, the USS providers. Um, are you considering that in your architecture or, or who actually is owning the registries. Thanks, Phil. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to remain somewhat generic between the way the FAA wants to do business and the way, for instance, the EASA wants to do business. Um, in the FAA's concept of the world, some of these registries are owned and operated by the FAA themselves and accessible through, for instance, SWIM. Um, I guess I was just trying to make the point that there are two fundamental classes of registries, those that will be generally accessible to the public and those that will be accessible only with some form of access controls. Um, it's widely anticipated that some form of registry function will be performed by the USSs, um, but that that will not be the end of the story um, because the USSs uh, are primarily there to serve the UAS operators and um, other uh, constituents um, may need to turn to things other than a USS to get the services that they need. I don't know if that was a, an answer to your question or not, Phil. That's okay, Stuart. That um, just helps me understand where you're coming from. Is that, um, obviously, it's going to depend on is owning and managing the data and therefore taking responsibility for the overall management of the privacy issue from a policy perspective. And, and um, I, I still think that's work in progress, not just in the US, but internationally. Oh boy, is it. Yeah, so one thing that I've seen is that FAA, um, some of FAA's thinking um, is still based upon the past, where there just weren't that many different aircraft and there weren't that many different aircraft operators and there weren't that many different fixed-based operations. And so it was feasible for the FAA with their resources to keep track of it all. Um, whereas with unmanned aircraft, you know, we could easily get to a situation where you know, the average human has three or four of them. Now, that's not next week, but, you know, we could get to that point. Um, and there's already more unmanned aircraft than than manned. In 2015, I think, there were more unmanned aircraft sold than the total number of manned aircraft that had been sold in the history of human aviation. Um, and, you know, and it hasn't gotten smaller since then. So I've been trying to address uh, as well scalability beyond what the FAA, at least, um, has been contemplating. Next slide. This is also unchanged, but it probably should be changed. Um, there may be additional operations that are not on this list. So I would really solicit everybody to look at this list 
and and um, identify what's missing. I think we have Shuai in the list. Uh, in the this is a uh, Yeah. Uh, I'm just wondering if anybody has talking to uh, any entity who's in the US, USS business. Uh, this looks like to me, you know, um, we might get some resistance from those people because this directly cut into their business. Um, they might need some architecture change to reflect uh, the registration, uh, searching, you know, register. I guess I'm not suggesting that we would stand up something that would compete with uh, the USSs, um, but rather suggesting that we might be able to provide standards so that USSs can do things in an interoperable and consistent fashion. I, I agree because the current USS, uh, there's, there's no like written uh, statement that US should do and how to do that. Uh, what, what FEV does, it's this public this uh, um, you know uh, lengthy program but there's no way for us for us to know how they're going to operate except this rest apis and all the data format that they have pro, uh, you know provided right i mean we have the discovery and synchronization service which is uh reasonably well defined and we have the inter uss protocol which is moderately well defined um but um there's there's a lot that they don't say yeah just give you a heads up in the gpp anything we do uh which is anything we propose which is to has anything to do with the uss we're going to get a this strong uh, pushback uh can give you some companies like airbus they have their business uh, in the uss utm uh, they don't want a, they don't want anybody to push any standard <laughs> For, for them to implement. Yeah, so that's a good point. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll expand upon it a little bit. Um, if we get so much pushback that we cannot say anything about USSs, then we basically cannot say anything about anything because USSs are the fat spider in the middle of the web that is um, UTM. Right, right, I, I totally agree. Um, but right now, I, there's nobody in the call from USS or UTM, right? Uh, just if the leader, the, I mean, I think, I think the last time there is a, a person from uh, Airbus uh, who's joining the call, um, he didn't see much of the stuff, uh, but eventually that might be a little problem for us. All we can do is hopefully hold out a hand to show that there's a way that can make it more open for the UAS manufacturers to work with the across the board with the USSs. If they don't have standards, then each um, UAS manufacturer will do something different for each place they sell their equipment. So that's where hopefully we will have to come in and hold out a uh, um, an offering hand to them. That's all we can do. Yeah, one, one thing for context, um, USSs are related to what in manned aviation is called an ANSP, an Air Navigation Service Provider, and different countries have adopted different models. In some countries, there is one and only one ANSP, and it is the same thing as the Civil Aviation Authority. It is a uh, governmental agency. In other countries, there is one and only one ANSP, but it is a private company to which the CAA has contracted the function. And then in still other countries, there are multiple ANSPs with, you know, uh, territories, if you will, that are somehow defined um, by the CAA. And so we're going to have, you know, a, a somewhat similar situation here. And right now, most of the USS uh, providers are trying to be the one ring to rule them all. So I guess next slide. Yeah, there we go. Um, background on identifiers, um, 
F3411 basic ID message gives us exactly that to work with. Um, an F3411 uh, authentication message, even if we were allowed to use all 10 pages of it, has exactly 224 bytes available minus any error control. And in the US, the FAA has said you need to have um, error correction, which is not present in the uh, ASTM standard. And the most obvious way to do that would use uh, 23 of those 224 bytes, leaving you with 201 bytes to work with, um, which obviously you're not gonna fit an X.509 certificate in that. And that's where we start moving into um, proposed solution space. So we've we've done a great deal of work in this area, and you know uh, I'm trying to like um, cut a cut right through my corpus callosum with a knife and say, okay, this half of my brain is going to work on solutions that I very much believe in and that we've already you know prototyped and and tested in part, um, and this other half of my brain will try to write you know requirements that are not wrapped around um, those solution. But you know as we move from requirements to architecture. Um, it's not at all clear to me how I can describe an architecture without uh, reference to our, you know, proposed solution approach. I just have um, a comment. I think in um, in a vehicular uh, communication, they're using another format for a certificate. Um, that I can't remember the format, um, and that one is much smaller than. Uh, 509. Bob, I don't know if you can speak to that since I know you've worked in, in V2V as well. Um, their certificate, they have large message frames to work in. <clears throat> They're doing uh, 8 to 11 uh, OCB. Um, they have uh, a large MTU. Uh, they can deal with, with, fair, with uh, fairly regular um, um, X509 certificates. We don't have that uh, um, option here. We have to work within the Bluetooth um, messages. Even Bluetooth 5 um, frames would not be able to handle anything that I have worked a, a fair bit with uh, trying to make small certificates. I've gotten um, EDDSA certificates as small as 600 bytes. Um, but then it's almost like nothing in in the uh, um, in the issuer name or or the subject name, so uh, it's like, it's pretty much a uh, a non-starter in in this arena. Okay, thank you. Um, I see an in the queue, Shui Tao. Thanks. Uh, this is Shui. Uh, just. Just want to say, I think the HIP is generally a really good solution for the uh, remote IDs. Uh, a quick update from the HPP, uh, in SA2, there is still no solutions how to assign uh, or and how to design the remote IDs. Uh, there are a bunch of gangsters trying to the, come up with solutions. Uh, there's just no agreement. Uh, I was hoping we can just move forward uh, with this solution and you know get it out. That people can refer to, uh, even though maybe as people won't use it, but that's that's one of the standards that they can refer to. Okay, so what you're saying is that 3GPP is um, in favor of a HIP based solution. They have no favor. Uh, okay. The strongly reference to STM, uh, but there are uh, strong disagreement regarding either STM one is good, either just using regular MAC address or some other solutions. There's no agreement. So at mm. this point, uh, this is still under discussion for each meeting. Uh, but I think the only reason they don't have any solution is because there's no standard. And, okay. and I think this hit point is, is, is great. One. Okay. Thank you. Best news I've heard all month. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, next slide. I see that Philip is also on the queue. Oh, sorry. Philip? Um, sorry, I didn't. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, Kershaw. Kershaw is on the queue. Uh, it's, it's a Shrey? Yeah. 
Okay, Stewart, please go forward. Thanks. Okay, so uh, next slide. So, um, a lot of the definitions uh, in the requirements draft are stuff that I wrote, and that's not what they should be. I need to go back to um, ICAO and other you know authoritative sources like that and make sure that our definitions are in alignment with theirs. I'll just spend a moment on plural forms. Um, I've gotten a fair amount of feedback on, on that. And stylistically, I used to do it in the way that was suggested in the feedback that I've received. But eventually, when it became clear that the EASA, the FAA, and ICAO were all doing it in the way where, for most of these acronyms, the plural form and the singular form are exactly the same, um, I finally yielded to you know what this user community is doing. Um, we want to continue our coordination with the uh, Trust Framework Study Group. Um, I think we need to increase our focus on registration. Um, do we want to move out more on crowdsourced RID? Do we want to get serious about operator to pilot comms? Um, that's something that I personally think is very important. And it was contemplated, I believe, by the Aviation Rulemaking Committee back in 2017, but it is not reflected in any of the external standards or notices of proposed rulemaking. Um, this is where I say, okay, there I am, and I have my device, and I've got an ID, and now what? You know, what, what good is it to me? I mean, if I want to go sue the guy later or fine him later, it's fine for that. But if I want to communicate with him right now and say, hey, guy, you, you need to leave that airspace that you're in because you may not know this, but, you know, we have an emergency on our hands and it's no longer the place and time to be to be out, you know, for a for a Sunday afternoon kite flying exercise. Um, Stu, but, don't you mean operate observer to pilot, not operator to pilot? Yes. That's observer. Yes. Thank you very much, Bob. That was hurriedly creating this slide in response to a request that there be such a slide. Yes, that is a gross error on my part. Observer to pilot comms, yes. And another remark here. I'm not sure it fits the drip chart at all. But we didn't see on this communication. It, that's the point. It, it may be maybe for our next push. It, it may be out of scope of our charter as currently stated, yes. Um, yeah, um, I think um, Mr. De Silva wants to say something. Great. Uh, thanks, Stu. Just a question. Uh, when you talk about this communication between the observer and the pilot, uh, what is the context of that? Because in civil aviation nowadays, this is not allowed at all. Uh, what is the context of that? Because it looks like from an aviation, international civil aviation perspective, it doesn't make any sense. But maybe you have an explanation for that. Yeah. Well, so remember, we're not we're not in the world of air traffic control. We're in the world of UAS traffic management. Um, these things are in much more uh, intimate proximity to humans and sensitive facilities and so on. And it is often necessary to you know urgently communicate with with uh, the operator of an aircraft. And so the, the, the classic example that I like to give is there's a fire and I'm a fireman and I've responded to the scene and I observe an aircraft, you know, hovering uh, in the area where my firemen are attempting to fight the blaze. Now, I don't know, is that aircraft, um, you know, from another fire department that also responded to the same large blaze um, or is that aircraft from a local, you know, television news organization that's at least going to be professionally operated, but may not be coordinated with our emergency response effort? Or is that aircraft just some gawker who may not even be all that well trained in how to fly, and he's going to get in the way and cause further danger for my um, my, my firefighters, right? So unmanned aircraft system remote identification alone allows me to discriminate which of those three classes um, he is in. But let's say that he is in the second or third class. He's not uh, a fellow firefighter. I may need to call him and say, you're endangering my firefighters. Withdraw by at least you know 200 meters from where you are right now. 
And this is what I refer to as immediate actionability of the information. First off, to make it actionable, to enable someone who observes a thing to do something about the thing, he's got to be able to trust the information. And so most of our efforts in DRIP thus far have been focused on making the information trustworthy. But then even if it's trustworthy information, um, if it's merely uh, a registry database that I can look into with human eyeballs on, on free text on screen and then you know take my cell phone and call somebody and hope that they answer and hope that they can do something about it, that, that's not very effective, right? Whereas if I can immediately establish um, you know, a strongly mutually authenticated and, and confidential end-to-end uh, -end IP flow between me and the pilot in command, then uh, perhaps we can you know, respond more appropriately to the situation. Uh, the other scenario that I like to use as an example is uh, air defense. If I'm an air defense operator and you blunder into an area where you shouldn't be, you'd probably appreciate my contacting you and asking you to exit before I simply shoot you down. And um, the UAS grid stuff, um, other than the original aviation rulemaking committee recommendations, just doesn't address that. Um, so does that clarify what that was all about? Uh, I understand where you're coming from, is to, but you know, in a certain moment, uh, UTM. Although we keep saying the UTM and USS, they'll be isolated. No, it's not true. They will interact with ATM, their traffic management, and as you correctly mentioned, uh, with analytics service providers. If you allow a simple observer to contact directly a pilot, whoever it is, you are, you can provoke a, a wild west because. You know, an observer is somebody that in principle, any observer, I'm not talking about the authorized observers who has a right equipment to identify the, the UAS, uh, the UA, uh, this is an information that you cannot trust. So you are inserting a risk in the system that when you have the integration of uh, UAM, uh, sorry, UTM and ATM, this will not be acceptable because it goes well beyond the principles that we follow in aviation. Uh, and my understanding is that the remote ID is exactly to allow authorized people to take action of contact and other observers who are just observers without any police power to see and communicate with somebody else who will take the action, but not themselves contacting director pilots because you may generate a, a wild west on that. But understand about that. No, I, I I totally agree with you. Can we scroll back to um, general requirements? Uh, I think the second page of general requirements. Yeah, right there, uh, Gen 6, dynamically establishing with AAA per policy um, these communications. The idea is it's not just that, that Joe Sixpack can, can contact a pilot and, you know, create a distraction from his safe operation of his aircraft. This is the idea that a public safety observer, for instance, or an air defense operator, for instance, um, can uh, reach out and if uh, he has the appropriate credentials uh, required by, you know, the policy of the CAA in that particular jurisdiction, then that would enable um, the communication. Um, because if we don't get uh, a direct contact after, you know, the satisfaction of policy has been verified, you know, for that contact to take place, the latency requirements are simply not going to be satisfiable, right? If I, as the firefighter, have to talk to the tower, and then the tower, in turn, has to talk to the operator. We're going to have a problem when these things fly at 60 knots and it's and it's only 50 meters away. So that's that's why I'm trying to um, extrapolate uh, from the traditional approach something that will satisfy the latency requirements of the you know um, very short distances that are involved, uh, with, with UAS, but definitely we can't just have Joe six pack bugging a pilot and, and interfering, you know, with his paying attention to the safe operation of his aircraft. There's 
to do it, so Phil Hall and I had my hand up in the queue. So can I jump in at this point? Yeah, absolutely, Jim. Okay, so I, I think what will be really helpful in the discussion here is that we um, actually try to develop a set of use cases that flash out practical, well, first of all, the practical environment that we will see but where such communications could occur. Now, whether they occur within a policy or not, um, if we develop these use cases, they will actually either validate the policy as workable or not, in their case, it will inform how policy development. But it also, it will identify whether the technology and the architectures we have to manage that are appropriate. I think we could talk around this for, for hours and hours, but I, th I think we could certainly invest a, um, a good deal of time, and I mean invest, in actually developing a case, a uh, number of scenarios or use cases, whatever you want to call them, that actually uh, articulates the, um, the possibilities we see, but also as support the argument why certain use cases should be eliminated or not be allowed um, on the basis of practical realities, as well as safety and privacy, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks, Phil. Yeah. I think if we go back to the in progress slide, that's the my concluding slide. Um, I think I've gotten my answer on that question. We are um, back up just about three slides uh, forward a little bit. In progress, uh, yeah, we are we are not in a position to get serious about uh, observer to pilot comms, other than in the sense that, yeah, we should we should document some use cases to justify you know why this is a useful function, and if we find that there are no such use cases, then we abort. Um, I think we will find that there are such use cases, but I guess that would be the that would be the the, the next task in that area is is the use cases rather than the protocols. And what I'm saying here is the use cases will identify the appropriate um, situations and the inappropriate situations. So, you know, I'm looking at from both both sides of the coin, if you like. Um, will help, the use case will help identify where it works and works well and where we should not allow it for obvious reasons. But obviously, the use case will change. Thank you. And my last three bullets, uh, there is a discussion limitation section that Andre has authored, and I just stuck it in the requirements uh, draft without um, comment, really. And I, I don't know where we want to go with that. Obviously, there's a whole set of related drafts that we need to organize in some coherent form, and we could still use more help. Um, just a um, clarification, when we're talking about communications, um, is that, I mean, someone talking directly to to the pilot saying, uh, how are you? What's your name? Or or is that just a message? You you are in a private zone or, I mean, a pre-format um, messages? So um, partly because I have a tendency to get the cart before the horse here with solution space, um, because HIP allows me to establish a strongly mutually authenticated and encrypted IP flow that can contain arbitrarily anything that IP can carry, I wasn't um, worrying about exactly what someone might choose to send, be it a small dictionary of predefined messages, or maybe it's even a, a voice over IP, you know, SIP call. Okay, yeah, yeah. Because that might change a little bit the, um, um, if we're allowing a, a conversations between the observer and um, there might be different type of communications. That's uh, what I was just uh, considering. Can I jump on the line? This is Ashray. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Uh, just, just wanted to say that I think in, in the general air, aviation, um, the the how to communicate with uh, between different aircraft it, it's it's changing quite a lot. I mean, five years ago, right after um, I mean, Forfly is getting very popular in the general aviation, uh, there are so many products came out uh, can allow I mean, all to show the EDSP data without ETC involvement, right? Things like Stratus. Right, you can actually see where the aircraft is without even talking to ATC. I think the same um, scenario can be applied with the UES. I mean, whoever 
adopt DERP uh, remote ID uh, techniques, right? And then um, things like Forflight or Stratus, they can talk to uh, 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 remote ID uh, a provider, either from a UAS or from, from a third party, you can actually acquire that data and show their show this UAS positions or other information on their for flight. This is actually, I think, uh, you're actually related to crowd um, uh, source remote ID and uh, also the observer to pilot communications uh, without even involving with the ATC. And, and, and from the charter, I was also said that the purpose of our working group is leveraging existing protocols to develop new protocols. I believe that those two is actually well fitting into the charter. Um, so, um, before Adam is uh, going into the queue, uh, we've reached the, the top of the hour. So, I mean, uh, we can continue that discussion a, a little bit. But uh, if you have to leave, I'm just reminding you to register your name uh, to the blue sheet, please. So, Adam. Hi. Um, so, I also want to make a comment on, so Bob was messaging in the WebEx on USS policy and what have you with these observer to pilot communications. Um, and it comes back to a point that was brought up earlier, um, I believe, by, yeah, it, actually by you, uh, Shui, that, you know, we don't have any USS people in the call, and this is some, another limitation and another feature we'd have to impose on them. As Bob's pointing out, the USS would be the one that'd be kind of mediate to say, oh, no, 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 you're not allowed to do this. Um, so I think that is something we have to keep into consideration as well. Also, this is true. And also, we can do it without the USS involvement. Like the Frofly and Estrada don't even talk to ETC. Um, they just acquire EDSV data from the ground, right? Um, so, whoever adopt uh, uh, ITF JERP uh, 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 standard, they can start their own, uh, you know, remote ID servers or providers uh, who then the other product is querying the data. We, we can do either way, right? But with the, with the US, I think it will be much better. If all you have is the broadcast RID messages, you will not know how to contact the pilot. Um, that would require going to the registry saying, here is this um, US ID. Can you please tell me who the pilot is? Give me information about the pilot. So that is why I'm saying that the, the USS or whatever particular entity has that registry information will be mediating that connection. Um, even more so when you go to the net um, RID, which is <clears throat> where all the information is not observable, but it's uh, maybe it's out of range, but you, you still see it in your area, and you have to then go hope they are being collected through net RID messages. So the so some entity was the USS, the net um, RID SP, SP or DP, whichever one it is, they are mediating that connection tell you who to contact. Which could be something as simple as um, a hierarchical hit reverse lookup followed by a forward lookup to a HIP resource record followed by a forward lookup to uh, an A record. Yeah, I mean, if the if the UA's address is in DNS with then the right pointer for the operator's ID, then all that would flow manner if the operator wanted to make that um, publicly available, yes. Or available within a DNS-like uh, private registry. Mm -hmm. So I think we pretty much covered this. So Bob, I apologize. Um, I. I was hoping to take less time than allocated, and I ended up taking more time than allocated. Um, uh, I hope um, maybe if our chairs will permit that we can at least um, identify some of the uh, related activity beyond these two drafts. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, Med, please. 
Yes. Yeah, actually, this is what we have agreed. I would say the year the first, the, the first interim meeting is that we will focus on the requirements and the architecture to have them. I would say on the good chip so that we can have the, uh, the, uh, the the progress by I would say by June or July to have something which is really stable. So we do understand that there are other drafts that are on on the table and. These drafts we uh, show them in the, I would say, in our slides. So we are really, um, we know that the um, uh, there are other items to be discussed, but we really need to, that we stay focused on the um, on what we are expected to, to deliver. So by the uh, next bit, by the, the, for the virtual uh, for the virtual um, IETF meeting. Uh, we are requesting, I would say, more a um, uh, longer slot. So we, we will assign some slots for other drafts to be to, to be presented. But for the um, the the next interim meeting, the one that will be in June, we will continue in this in this space that we are scheduling. That means that uh, exclusively focusing on the requirement and uh, uh, and the architecture draft. Uh, and we don't need to wait until the interim meetings to have discussion on them. So I really hope and invite all the participants. So if there are any, I would say, suggestion, proposal, and so on, to go to the mailing list to share them and to um, to um, to uh, so that we can we can we can make some progress and to have some some versions that are really stable. The requirement draft, I would say, it's I would uh, uh, is it, it, is is on a good track. But the architecture for me uh, require more. To, uh, to focus on it so that we can have something which is really I would say that can be uh, used by uh, by other uh, uh, other um, uh, people who are working on the on this area and for instance if people want to uh, to propose some change request for for instance in the 3 GBP if we have a, a, an architectural document which is really um, on, on, on good shape that can be something that we can defend and, and discuss with, uh, with 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 delegates that are attending the 3 GBP so yeah uh, we uh, we are aware there are other, other drafts but we are really uh, want we, we that we, we can stay focused on on on, on this on, the, on these two ones Matt, all I was going to say following up was the drafts are out there. I invite people to read them and to comment to me directly or on the list or both. Thank you. Perfect. So um, I, I think we, we make um, adjourn this meeting now or is, is there anything that uh, someone uh, wants to add at that point? So, yeah, so basically before closing that meeting, I, I think we're going to close this meeting in a few minutes. Um, so I, I think the discussions were very interesting and I, I think those interim meetings are quite successful. So we will continue to that. Um, we sent a request uh, for um, a session during the IETF, the next IETF meeting. So in June, end of June or no, end of July. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how it's going to be handled. Maybe that's just going to be, I, I don't know how the virtual ITF is going to be, if, if everything is going to be within one week or, but we will continue this interim meeting to make progress um, in any case. Um, yeah, as Ahmed mentioned, uh, we would like to really move those uh, requirement and architecture draft uh, forward as soon as possible. So um, it's it's quite important that we communicate those drafts to other organizations, we get feedbacks, and um, yeah, and that we, we reach um, uh, a consensus that we believe it's ready uh, quite soon. Um, anyone in the queue? Yeah, go ahead. So I can, so. Thanks. Thanks, this is right. I'm just kind of wondering what's the milestone we have said, or we haven't for this two draft. Um, I can't take the. Um... Yeah, for, for this two one, we, we have said that we wanted to have, I would say, um, an aggressive schedule for um, for um, having stable versions and for uh, for having them in the working plus call. And if I remember well, what we have agreed is to have something by uh, by end of July. So. If we want to maintain that milestone, it will be really, <laughs> we will need to, uh, to, to, to put more, I would say, uh, more effort on it and to, uh, so that we can have something which is really stable. So, I mean, you will see, like, end of July, I mean, it's uh, uh, sent it to our IESG for uh, our received 
application. Is that what you mean? For, for the working group last call, that's the uh, I would say that's what we have discussed in the in the first um, uh, interim meeting we, we had. That's 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 a milestone. So we we, we will see if we we will we will meet it and have that the target. And and if we all together work on it and um, share the comments, review and send it to Stewart and all the other authors, uh, we we can do it. Otherwise, it will be um, we, we it will be difficult to 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 meet this one. Yeah, I think so, we should. I think. We should. Yeah, for, for me, this is really a prerequisite if we want to uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to uh, to ignite other works to have these two ones because otherwise we we will we will waste our effort and energy in other items and we won't uh, progress on these two ones that are uh, that 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 are the I would say what are what we are expected to deliver um, um, to to, uh, to to the AG. Yeah. Okay. I agree. I think that we are. ITF is already we ahead of the other gangsters in terms of this topic. So uh, I would prefer we can get something out and, as, a, as a reference for others, to, um, you know, to, to look at it. Um, so is, at this point, you know, we are the first one on top, I think. Personal opinion. Mm. Well, I will point out that the ANSI roadmap gaps are important for people to look at. I will post again the URL to get the uh, um, the previous version, and you can look at the gaps, and, and when the month will be the final version of version two, look at the gaps that ANSI and others have identified, and look at where we can have a hand in. Many of them don't apply to us, like, like manuals stuff like that, the safety uh, um, design. But a lot of areas do apply to us. Look at the gaps and see how they map to our requirements. I think that would be a, a, another important thing. Thank you, Bob. Hi, this is Adam. I agree with Bob. You know, I've always seen this working group as a bit unusual, I guess, in the sense that, you know, we're looking out and, and outside and another thing and we're seeing gaps that we can fill with IETF protocols. So, like, we can, we can move much faster than they can. I think that's been evident over the past couple months that we're moving much quicker than they are. And I agree with Med that we are ahead of them. So we can move faster to fill holes with stuff that we already know works and can be applied to uh, given problems. By the way, they asked me if ITF is doing anything on blockchain because in one area in transaction tracking, they're proposing that there's a gap that there's no blockchain work. And I don't know much that we're doing in blockchain in ITF. It's IRTF, I think. <laughs> yes, it's IRTF. But I was asked. Okay, so, yeah. I think we're making good progress, but we we don't need to to relax now. We are we're in pretty good track, I think. And um, yeah, thank you for um, thank you for, uh, for to everyone to attend the meeting and to move that work forward. And I'm I'm waiting to see you at the ITF or next interim meeting. Yes, and please use the mailing list to share your comments and your reviews. Can anyone translate the last sentence format in the chatting box? <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> Couldn't understand. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye, -bye. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone.